my name is Ben Pope from Oxford. Um, I was just wondering about, you use a genetic algorithm with lots of free parameters and then try and minimize chi-squared. Um, genetic algorithms are notoriously good at overfitting. Have you, have you tried to use something like a, a nested sample or something to get Bayesian evidence rather than a chi-squared differential to try and see if you're just getting an effect of, you know, uh, an overfitting? Yeah, no, we haven't, and I don't think it's necessary. No? Uh, and I'll, I'll explain why. So we, we build up the genetic fits uh, from, even in complex data, just one parameter all the way up to n parameters, where n is quite large. So we try... You know, we, we, try, we, don't, we don't start with a complex model. We start with a model which is clearly inadequate to fit the data. And we, so, we, so it's, a, you know, it's a sledgehammer. I think of a genetic algorithm as a sledgehammer approach. You're basically trying all the possible um, first guesses that you can. Uh, and then we solve for alpha for, for each of those possible, um, each of those uh, first guesses. And what's really interesting um, is that as you, uh, and you can define a range in um, models, quite a broad range actually, uh, where the statistics don't vary all that much, whether you use chi-squared, uh, whether you use uh, AKK information criteria, whether you use some, you know, whatever you use, you can define any number of uh, statistical tests, which we have, uh, in order to define a range in, in models. And what's really interesting in this case, and kind of comforting, is that the value of alpha that you get out in individual cases is remarkably stable once you've gone past um, a, a, a reasonable point in your model fitting process. So even when you've got a model which isn't that good, your, your value of alpha has kind of settled out. And so the, the, I don't really see the, the, you know, the need to... I mean, when you quote the result then, what you have instead of a single result is essentially a, a set of results. But that set of results is, is generally well within the one sigma error bars, interestingly. But... Uh, is there any covariance that you can measure using, because genetic algorithms just optimizes typically, unless you, you know, put bells and whistles on them. Can you measure the covariance of alpha with any other fitted parameter? Well, like what? You know, um, redshift or, you know, something. I, I'm not really sure. Um, yeah. Or temperature or something of the cloud. If um, they're covariant, that would decrease the significance if... Um, you're using a chi-squared test. No, but we've done we've done enough Monte Carloing to to know that we that the error uh, estimates that we're getting out are are actually slightly um, too large. So I'm I'm very confident in the um, in the in the numerical estimates of the of the error contours, taking into account correlations between parameters. Mm. Cool. Yeah, that's I'm not confident in too many things, but in that I am confident that. My name is Daniel Sudarsky from Mexico. Uh, I wanted to know what would be the simplest standard physics explanation for, for this phenomena, because there are some assumptions. You were saying, for instance, that one is assuming that the gas is, all the components of the gas are in a single location and in a single, let's say, gravitational potential. If these are elements and, uh, and the gas is very cold, for instance, there could be a different decanting of heavier elements towards, uh, let's say, inside the, deep inside the, 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 the cloud and, and lighter elements in yeah. the outer yeah. parts, things of that sort? Yeah, okay, so you're basically saying there could be spatial segregation between the different species that we're using and that could give us a systematic uncertainty or systematic error in the value of alpha. You're quite right, um, that's, that's possible. The, we, we, Two points. We try and safeguard against that by only comparing <coughs> species that have similar ionization potentials, such that there should be only very small or no spatial segregation. There would be no reason for the, uh, the species to be segregated, provided that we si stick to similar ionization potentials. Would not be true if we if we threw everything together and had high ionization species with low ionization species. We know they're segregated. First point. But you might say, nevertheless, there could be just you're, you're making highly precise measurements here. There still could be some spatial segregation which could produce offsets of ten to the minus five or so, and that's true. But don't forget, we are. Um, I mean, it's not always. There are several reasons why that. That isn't the explanation. Um, these are optically thin gas clouds. 
we're not seeing uh, a radiating surface at us. We're taking a line of sight through a gas cloud. So that would mean, unless somehow we'd managed, we managed to work out our spatial segregation such that always the iron is near us and the magnesium is furthest away from us, which is ridiculous, then it cannot be, um, but that's because they're optically thin. It, it, th that cannot explain a dipole effect. And, and we're using the same transitions uh, from both telescopes in all directions on the sky, more or less. Not quite, because one thing I didn't explain, nobody has asked, is why then did you see a monopole in the Keck data but not in the VLT data? And I forgot to explain that. And it's really related to what you're asking about. And the reason is that the two instruments, um, or at least at the time at which the data were collected, were a little bit different. Um, and the data uh, were a little bit different. The um, number of transitions that we had at the same redshift in the VLT data was generally larger than the number of tran transitions that we had available in the Keck data. And the number of anchor lines that we had available for the VLT data was larger. So we may have had both silicon and, mag and magnesium, for example, but only magnesium uh, in the case of the Keck data. We were more sensitive um, and we we knew this in advance of making the isotopic measurements. We were more sensitive to isotopic variation of magnesium in the Keck spectrum than we were in the VLT data. And that's why when we corrected for it, the correction was bigger for the Keck data than it was for the VLT data, and why things align then quite nicely in terms of the mon monopole just going back to zero. So the answer to that question is no, it's not due to that. It's something else. If it's a systematic, it's not that. It's something else. John, thank you so much for a wonderful talk.